Alright, sorry about that. Keynote decided it didn't want to cooperate for a minute. A couple quick announcements if you didn't see the email that I sent last night. We have office hours that are posted on Sakai. Also, the discussion section is going to be on Fridays at 3.30 starting next week. I apologize if that time doesn't work. It was the time that worked for the greatest number of people based on the doodle poll. We'll try to f work out some way to record it in case that time doesn't work for you. And also, January 24th and 25th, I believe that's tomorrow night and Friday night, there's going to be an R course at the Odom Institute. If you want some additional background in R, as you can see, we're going to start discussing R today. And, I mean, I'll go over it in class, and you should be able to learn everything you need to know in class, but I will be going over it kind of quickly. And in the past, some people felt like they wanted some additional exposure to it. So there's this course at the Odom Institute, which is fairly timely. We'll also be going over it in the discussion section. And lastly, the first homework assignment will be posted, hopefully, today. And I'll send out an email once it's ready. So at any rate, as I was saying, a discussion of R. R is a statistical computing package, and the software package that I'll be teaching in this class, it <coughs> has a number of advantages that makes me made me want to adopt it in this class. I mean, first of all, just out of complete best of self-interest, it's the programming language that I use in my day-to-day -to -day work, so I know it better than anything else. But it has other advantages as well. Number one, it's free. As I'll show you in a minute, you can download it onto your own personal computer without having to pay any money or run over to the library to get copies of it or whatever. It's platform independent, whether you use Windows, Macs, or Linux, or whatever, R will run on it. It's extremely customizable and powerful. I mean, as I say, it's simple enough you can use it in this class, but powerful enough that I use it for my own research. And it's, at least in my opinion, becoming the software of choice for a lot of modern biomedical research, particularly in high-throughput genetics, the bioconductor project, and so forth. There's enough free software, R software out there for bench science applications that I thought it's the best platform to use in this class. Now, that isn't to say that it's that there's only good things to say about it. The biggest problem with it is it does have a bit of a learning curve. It's not a simple point-and-click interface. It's a bit non-intuitive and it takes some practice. Luckily we have this class. I will, I think I forgot to post this, the manual on Sakai last night. I'll do it today, but I'll post a little manual that kind of has an overview I'll step you through it in the slides. There's the Odom Institute. There's a discussion section. And failing all this, you're also welcome to just send me an email if you can't give it R to do what you want and you're ready to tear your hair out. Just email me and hopefully I can help you with it. So, first things first, how do you get R? Well, it's distributed through this organization called CRAN, which is the Comprehensive R Archive Network. You can see the URL on this slide. If you go to that web page, you can see there it says there's pre-compiled distributions for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Then all you have to do is select the operating system that you're using, download, and install. Hopefully it's completely straightforward. Historically nobody's had major problems with this, but I mean if you do have any trouble with this, feel free to email me and I'll try to help. So to start R, if this varies somewhat depending on what operating system you're using. For both Mac and Windows, what you'll probably want to do 
is just find the little R icon either on your start menu or your applications folder in Mac and click on it and you'll see a screen something like this. Personally, I use Linux most of the time and run it from the command line and you can just type R on the command line if you're a geek like me. But one thing that you'll want to get the hang of quickly in R is setting the working directory. By default, when you save data or code in R, it'll save it in a file called .rdata in the directory where R is running. And, I mean, you can do as how you want, but my personal recommendation is that you store each project in a separate directory, each homework assignment in a separate directory if you're using it for lab work, each project in a separate directory, otherwise you'll quickly have 10 million variables in your R workspace and it becomes a big pain to use. And if in Windows or Mac, if you want to change the directory, you can go to the file menu at the top of the screen. There should be a command change directory. I mean, like I said, I usually run it from the command line in Linux, so I think that's right. If it doesn't work, send me an email and I'll figure it out. And you can also change the working directory from the command line using this command set wd command here. Type in the full name of the path. In Windows and Mac, you probably will not want to do that, but if you're a command line person, that's the way you do it. So, <clears throat> to get help in R, if you can't remember how to use a particular command in R, any R command, you can get some documentation for it if you type question mark and then the name of the command. So if you can't remember how the set wd command works in R, if you type set question mark set wd at the command line in R, it will bring up help, which tells you how to use that particular command. And even now, I use this all the time. If I can't remember now, what are the three parameters for this particular function? Or something like that. And if you can't remember the name of a command, there's another command that you can use, help.search. And then you put a keyword in quotation marks. Say you were thinking, I want to change my working directory but I don't remember the name of the command to change the working directory. So I'll search for a command that contains the word directory. So you say help.search directory. And it gives you a list of commands. And conveniently it looks like set wd isn't on here, but it does give you get wd. And if you do question mark get wd, it turns out it's the same as set WD, so good thing that I may gave a confusing example at the very beginning, huh? But in general, if you just say help.search and search for a keyword, that can help you find a command if you can't remember the name of a particular command. And to quit R, there's a couple ways to do it. If you're using Windows or Mac, if there's a quit option under the file menu. Another way you can do it is from the R command prompt. If you type, you can type Q and then parentheses no or yes, depending on whether or not you want to save your work. Basically, as I'll show you here in a minute, you can define variables in R. Usually, these variables will be data that you've stored in R. If you want to save the data that you've stored in R, then you can quit and save your work. Otherwise, say no. Most of the time, I recommend saving your work unless you just did some quick thing that you don't want to bother to remember. <coughs> and it's also worth noting that R is case sensitive. You have to type, if a command name is lowercase, you have to type it in lowercase. If you say capital Q to quit or set WD with capitals, it won't work.
Likewise, the command name has capital letters in it, which isn't common, but does happen. You'll need to use those capital letters when you enter that particular command. So now I'll give you a simple example of how to read some data into R. This is a data set on plant growth where there's two different treatments uh, applied to a set of plants and the objective is to see if either treatment has any effect on the growth of the plants. So in this experiment there are a total of 30 plants. They assign 10 to the first treatment, 10 to the second treatment, and then 10 controls. And the objective is to compare the dry weights of the three groups. And I'll use this data set for a couple examples over the course of the next few lectures, but for now, this is just to illustrate how to read the d data into R. So, this slide here shows you what the raw data looks like. I also put a copy of this data set on Sakai in in both CSV and Excel format if you're really motivated and want to download it and play around with that, but for the time being you don't need to worry too much about the exact numbers. So now I'll describe how you can enter data into R. The simplest way, which you probably won't want to do unless you have a really small data set, but I'll show it here just in case you ever need to do this. The simplest way is just to type it all in manually. And already 10 billion R commands that will probably make your head want to explode, so I'll try to step you through it here. The C command in R just stands for concatenate, which basically says give R a list of numbers or names or whatever, it will spit out a vector of all the things that you get it. So in this case, see, here's the list of weights on the previous slide. Say we wanted to enter all these weights in manually. So we just say weight in R, this little arrow sign where you do like a less than sign followed by a dash, that's an assignment operator. It's saying that let weight equal that big long list of things. And actually, nowadays, if you want to use an equal sign rather than that little arrow thing, equal sign will also work and is probably less confusing. Once upon a very long time, equal sign didn't work. You had to use that little arrow thing, and so I've just gotten into the habit of doing it that way. But if you want to use an equal sign instead, that also works. So I say concatenate this big long list of numbers, and the big long list of numbers is all the numbers in the data set. And I define it to be equal to this variable called weight. Then if I say weight, you can see it gives me a vector of length 30, where each element of the vector is the weight of one of these plants. Like I said, there are more efficient ways to do this, but if you ever need to enter data into R manually, that's how you do it. Now, we also want to enter in this group variable to specify whether it's control or treatment one or treatment two. And in principle, I could do the same thing. I could say group equals C, control, 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 comma, treatment one, treatment one, treatment one, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't want to type control 10 times, there's this R command rep, which stands for repeat, which says, so what I'm saying here is group equals, combine all these into a vector, first of all, control repeated 10 times, then treatment one repeated 10 times, then treatment two repeated 10 times. Oh, that saves me the trouble of having to type control 10 different times and treatment one 10 different times and so forth. And you'll also note that this command at the top that's called factor, just so that I can overload you with as many commands and pos as possible in one of the first slides on R in this course, 
but what factor says is that this particular vector should be treated as a factor or, an ordin or a categorical variable rather than a continuous variable. As you'll recall from a few lectures back, a continuous variable is just basically a numeric variable, something that has numbers in it, whereas a categorical variable, as the name implies, is something that has categories. So if treatment versus control would be a categorical variable, male versus female is a categorical variable, race, white versus African American versus Hispanic versus Asian, something like that would be a categorical variable. So this factor command in R tells R that it should be treated as a categorical variable. You'll see when I type the variable group, it gives the word control repeated 10 times, then treatment 1 repeated 10 times, treatment 2 10 times. Then it says levels, control, treatment 1, treatment 2. That's R telling you that group is a categorical variable with three different levels, namely control, treatment 1, treatment 2. If you just give it the factor command, R is smart enough to see that there's only three different levels of the variable and gives you those three levels. So <clears throat> that was a lot in one slide. I'm, now I'm going through a lot of this again a little bit more slowly. As I said, the C command concatenates the various arguments to create a vector in this little dash, less than dash sign, assigns value to a variable, as I said, an equal sign also works. And things that you define in R don't necessarily have to be numbers. And as you can see here, I define a vector called blah that's a list of five numbers, but I could also put store my the list of names for my BIO 610 class a couple of years ago in a vector called BIO 610. These were all the students in the class. And if you just give it a list of strings, basically a list of names, R is perfectly happy to store that in a variable either as well. It doesn't have to be numbers. And if You've defined a bunch of variables, but you can't remember what they called them. If you do this command in R objects, that will give you the list of all the variables in your workspace. Thus far, I've defined these variables by a 610, black, group, and weight, and two other variables that I'll show here in a second that I don't think I've given you the commands for yet. Note that you don't just type objects, you say objects, open parentheses, close parentheses. Whenever you call a function in R, you always have to include those parentheses, even if there's not any actual parameters. If you just type objects without this, it'll spit out the R source code for the objects command, which probably is not what you want. You can try it sometime if you want to see what I'm talking about. But in general, you always need to include the parentheses when you call R functions. And if you're not using a variable anymore that you've defined and want to get rid of it so that it doesn't clog up your workspace, you can use this RM command, which stands for remove. Say I have that variable blah that I just defined as an example. I'm never going to use it again. I don't want a list of our variables to fill up three pages, so I'll get rid of it. I say remove blah, and then I do the objects command. Note that the blah variable is no longer there. It's because I deleted it. Any R variable that you've defined, you can get rid of using the RM command if you don't want it anymore. And if you want to save your work any, <clears throat> at any point during, if you want to save your work at any point during your R session, you can just type this command save.image and it will save a copy of all your variables to your hard drive. 
it's it's just sort of like saving your document in Word. Assuming that nothing goes wrong, you don't really need to do it until you're until you're ready to quit the program, but particularly if you've just been working on your homework for the past three hours, you may want to do saved on image occasionally so that you don't lose everything if the power goes out or your battery dies or something like that. And in Windows slash Mac, in addition to doing the save.image command, I believe there's a command under the file menu where you can just go file, save workspace image, or something like that. And as I said before, the wrap command in R, that's a repeat command. It takes two arguments. The first argument is the thing that you want to repeat. The second argument is the number of times you want to repeat it. So if you say rep 3 comma 5, that says repeat the number 3 5 times. So we get 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 5 threes. Or if you say rep 4 10 times, then we get 4 tens. And as we saw earlier, you if you're repeating several things then want to combine them, you can use the C command to combine them. If you want three repeated five times followed by four repeated ten times you can go C rep three five rep four ten you get a vector of length fifteen with three fives and four tens and as I told you before the factor command in R tells R to treat a, a specific vector as categorical data this is something we'll discuss in more detail later. If you just go C11223, that treats it as a vector of numbers. Number one, number one, number one, number two, number two, and number three. Or as you say, factor of this thing, then it treats it rather as continuous numbers. It treats them as categories. So category 1, category 2, category 3, and in general it doesn't assume, if you just say factor, it assumes that it's unordered, so it doesn't assume that 2 is bigger than 1 and 3 is bigger than 2, they are just three categories that are completely arbitrary. Say so, hey, we'll discuss this in more detail later, I think on Friday actually. And if Next we'll briefly discuss importing data from Excel. In general, if your data set is more than a couple lines, you're not going to want to enter it into R manually like I demonstrated. You'll probably collect your data using some other program, Excel, the vast majority of the time, and then load it into R. So if you have data in Excel that you want to load into R, the it is possible to read Excel spreadsheets into R directly, but it's a headache, and honestly, the vast majority of the time, it's not worth the trouble. The best way to read data from Excel into R is just to export it to CSV, comma-separated version format, and then read that into R, because reading CSV files into R is much easier. Hopefully most of you have probably worked with CSV before at some point in your lives. If you haven't, it's just basically it spits the Excel spreadsheet out in a text file where all the data fields are separated by commas. And to convert Excel to CSV is extremely easy. In Excel, you can just do save as and at the bottom of the window, it's, there should be a file type menu. By default, it will try to save it as XLS format or XLSX format in the newer versions. If you go to that particular window and change XLS format to text CSV, and it may ask you what field text delimiters you want, you can just save the defaults then that will create a version of your spreadsheet with the .csv extension. And then to read the data into R, 
you can use this read.csv command that if I'd save the plant growth data in CSV format that basically yeah, I put an I put a copy of this data set both in Excel and CSV on Sakai, but basically it has two columns. Column one is weight, column two is group. So the first column is just the list of the 30 weights. The second column is just control, 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 10 times, treatment one, treatment one, and so on, 10 times, and treatment two, 10 times. So to read that into R, I just take this file plantgrowth.csv and say plant growth equals read.csv plant growth. And it's this plant growth variable will be saved in what's called a data frame in R. A data frame basically means that it's it's basically just R form for saving a spreadsheet where each column has a name and to access a particular column you can just say dollar sign column name. So if I want to access the weight column of this spreadsheet I can just go plant growth dollar sign weight. I get a list of weights. If I want to see the group then I can go plant growth dollar sign group. I get a list of the group that each particular weight belongs to. And this is where what I said before about changing your directory becomes important. If this command, if you have trouble getting this command in R to work, usually it means you haven't set your directory to the correct place. So before you do the read.csv command, make sure you change your working directory to be the same directory where you save the plantgrowth.csv file. Hopefully that's reasonably self-explanatory, but if you have trouble getting this to work on the homework, send me an email before you tear too much of your hair out. So, that's just kind of the basics in R in terms of inputting data and saving and quitting R and so forth. Now let's show how we can actually do something that we might want to do in R. That, and when we discussed experimental design, I talked about how it's important to randomize when you design your experiments that you should randomly assign your various experimental units to be in the treatment group or the control group or whatever. Now, if you're just doing a study on six rats, and then you wouldn't necessarily need R, you could just flip a coin or whatever, but if you're doing a salt vaccine trial with tens of thousands of participants, you're not going to want to flip a coin for each one. Oh, one thing that you may want to do in R is randomization, where you randomly assign your experimental units to treatment and control, or treatment one, treatment two, slash control, or whatever the case may be. So I'll show you how you can do that in R for basically the remainder of today's discussion. So let's assume a really simple case control design. Say you have 20 rats, you want 10 rats to be assigned to a treatment group, 10 rats to be assigned to a pl placebo group. We'll assume they're homogeneous, we're not going to do any blocking. We just want 10 in the treatment group, 10 in the control group. And say we want to do uh, an R. How can we go about doing that? Well, the simplest approach in R is to use this command called sample. It basically, it, you give it a list of numbers and it will return a sample of that list of numbers. There's various different bells and whistles that you can do with this sample command. You can tell it's a sample with or without replacement. 
you can do probability sampling where some observations are more likely to get sampled than others. We won't go into all the details of that today. Today we'll just do the very simple case where we want, say, a sample of size 10 out of a list of 20 things. So how can we do at and R? Well, simplest way is you just give each of your rats a number from 1 to 20. You say sample 1 colon 20 comma 10. Now first of all this 1 colon 20 that's another little R trick that I haven't taught you yet. 1 colon 20 is just a shorthand for saying 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 up to 20. It says give it a list when you say 1 colon 20, that means all the numbers one by one from 1 to 20. And so the comma 10 says select a sample of size 10 from the numbers 1 to 20. So if your rafts are numbered 1 to 20, this says randomly choose 10 of those rafts without replacement. It gives you those 10 numbers and... Uh, gives you those 10 numbers. If you were doing your experiment, you could say those 10 rafts get assigned to the treatment group, the other 10 get assigned to the control group. Easy enough. As I said before, in R, if the syntax 1 colon 5 means the same thing as, as C12345. C12345 gives me the numbers 1 to 5. If I just type 1 colon 5, I get the same thing, and it saves me a bit of typing. And R is perfectly happy to randomize things that aren't numeric. Say I was in a bad mood when I prepared these slides a couple of years ago and decided to harass a couple of my students in class that day, but I don't want to be discriminatory, so I decide I'm going to choose who I want to harass at random. Oh, recall I created this vector bio 610 for my students in class a couple of years ago. If I want to randomly choose a sample of four students to harass, I can just say sample from this bio 610 vector, and it gives me a list of four names. So... If you had a list of, say, names in R rather than numbers, and you want a sample of a given size, R is very happy to do that as well. So let's suppose we have a slightly more complex design that rather, just having, rather than just having a treatment group and a control group, Say that we want to do the plant growth experiment where we have a total of 30 plants and two treatments, so we want to assign 10 to be controls, 10 to be treatment 1, and 10 to be treatment 2. How can we do that in R? Well, the easiest way to do this in R is to just say sample 1 colon 30. Note that I didn't specify the sample size. If you don't specify the sample size, then it assumes you want a sample of size 30, the same size as your original input date. In that case, since we're doing it without replacement, it just gives you the numbers 1 through 30 back and with the order permuted. So, say in this case, I say... I'm going to randomly permute the order of my sample labels. The first 10 will be assigned to the control group. The next 10 will go to treatment 1. The next 10 will go to treatment 2. So I define this variable plant rand to be all the numbers 1 through 30 in random order. Then I say the first 10 go to the control group. The second 10 go to treatment 1, the final 10 go to treatment 2. Now you'll, you'll notice new syntax here. Plant ran gives me the full data set. I go plant ran, square brackets, 1 colon 10, then 21 colon 30, then, or 11 colon 20, and then 21 colon 30. When I do that, 
plant rand 1 colon 10 gives me the first 10. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 17 is the 10th observation. Then when I say plant rand 11 colon 20, I get 19, which is the 11th object in the vector 19, 14, 3, 27, 12, 29. So on, and then plant ran 21 colon 30 gives me the final 30 observations up here 26, 6, 11, 5, 30, 21, 20, and so on. If you have a large data set and you only want some subset of the data, then you can use this syntax square brackets and then give it the indices of the numbers that you want to give, that you want to see, and R will spit them out. So I said, in general in R, if you can use square brackets to reference a subset of the vector, my bio 610 class from a couple years ago, if I want the fifth person on the list, I can go bio 610 <coughs> of five, I get Jennifer, i.e. the fifth name on the list. If I want the fifth through the eighth people on the list, I can go bio 610, 5, colon 8. I get number 5, Jennifer, number 6, Catherine, number 7, Ankunda, number 8, Alicia, and so on. And now let's say that you'll recall the turkey growth example from a couple lectures ago where what they're adding methionine to the diets of turkeys to enhance their growth they want to compare three different types of methionine which they call T1, T2, and T3 and they're going to measure the weights of 12 turkeys over a three week period and Recall the design of this particular experiment is the cages are stacked on top of each other four layers high. You have three cages on the floor, three cages on the next row, three cages on the following row, and so on. And the cages near the ceiling are warmer, and the amount that a turkey eats depends on the temperature. So the if to control for the effect of temperature what we do is put three turkeys on each row of cages with one turkey assigned to each treatment group. So on the, the bottom row of cages, there'll be one turkey that gets T1, one that gets T2, and one gets T3. On the next row, one gets T1, one gets T2, and one gets T3, and so on down the list. So let's say we want to do this design in R, how would one go about doing it? Once again, the easiest way to do it is you just randomize four different times. Uh, assign labels to the turkeys on the bottom row, of one, two, three. Assign labels on the next row, one, two, three, and so on. Then randomize, say the bottom row. Turkey one gets treatment three, turkey two gets treatment two, turkey three gets treatment one. Then on the next row, turkey one gets treatment three, turkey two gets treatment one, turkey three gets treatment two, so on down the line. In general, I mean, I can't give you like the grand unified theory of randomized experiments in R. You just have to think this through and say, Given my experimental design, what am I randomizing? What am I blocking? How's the easiest way to do this in R? And honestly, for a lot of these examples, there's more than one correct way to do this. And you'll get some practice doing some randomization in R on the second homework assignment, which won't come out for another week or two. The first homework assignment won't use R, it'll just be pretty much entirely experimental design stuff. So, I know 10 bazillion R commands all at once in the future, there we won't 
do this much new R stuff in one lecture, I promise. When you're introducing the software, there's no good way to avoid it. But R commands to remember for today, if you say question mark and then type in the name of the command, it'll give you the help file for that particular command. If you do help.search and then type in a keyword, it will give you the commands for that particular keyword. Help.search directory to find commands related to directories. If you said help.search repeat, if you couldn't remember the name of the rep command, whatever the case may be. Go C234, some other arguments. It'll concatenate those arguments into a vector or some of the shorthand. If you want, need to repeat a particular digit 10 times, you can go rep2, 10. And if you want to list all the objects that you've defined in your current workspace, you can use the objects command. If you want to remove a particular variable from your workspace, you can use the rm command. Save.image, save your current workspace, or you can also do that from the file menu. If you want to read in a CSV file, you can do read.csv plant growth .csv or whatever the name of the CSV file that contains your data set. And if you need shorthand for a series of consecutive digits, you can do 1 colon 5, 1 colon 10, 1 colon 1000, whatever the case may be. If you need a specific element of a specific vector, you can go bio 610 of 5 to get the fifth element, bio 610 of 5 colon 8, get fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth elements. And if you need to sample, say, a sample of size 3 from the numbers 1 to 10, you can go sample 1 colon 10 comma 3.